I love public speaking. I love it because public speaking is an opportunity for me to entertain while speaking with power and wisdom to you guys. But you know what I love more than public speaking? Preaching. Preaching because I get to not only speak with power, speak with wisdom, teach you things, but I get to do so with absolute truth. I can have confidence that whatever I tell you, as long as it lines up with the Bible, is absolutely true. And that's a great encouragement to me. Now, you guys will see, you know, my style is probably different than some of the folks that come up here. I'm very intense. I can get loud. It's just the way that I am. And, and people will say to me, Colin, you're speaking to kids. Why don't you bring it down to their level, Colin? Make it simple so they can understand. Why don't you use a metaphor with an Easter egg or something to tell them about Jesus? <laughs> Look, the wisdom of the world is foolishness to God. That's why. I'm going to preach to you the way the Bible tells me to preach to you. The Bible tells me that I should preach to you children the same way I would talk to an adult. Let me prove it to you. Nehemiah 8, 1 and 2, And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. And Ezra the priest, priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding. Now let me take you to another book just to further cement that. Ezra 10.1 Now when Ezra had prayed and when he had confessed, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, there assembled unto him out of Israel a very great congregation of men and women and children. He didn't change the way he speaked. He was weeping on the ground and lamenting about the sins of Israel in front of the kids. So I'm not going to get up here and speak to you as children today. I'm going to speak to you as a dying man speaking to dying men and women. So if at any time it gets too difficult, you guys can move to the back of the room because, again, I do get loud. Sorry. Um, so that was the introduction. And I want to hammer home one more verse because we're going to be going through a lot of Bible today. Now it says in 1 Corinthians 2.13, Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. You see, Scripture, the Word of God, is spiritual. And so we will be comparing the Word of God with the Word of God to get to the truth. And that's what we're supposed to do. Now, today's topic is my favorite topic. I'm going to speak to you about salvation today. Mr. Collin loves talking about salvation because Mr. Collin's heart is for evangelism. I want to see people saved. I want to see people in heaven with me one day. I don't want to see anybody end up in the other place. So Mr. Collin loves to talk about evangelism. One of the most famous verses in the Bible is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but we'll have everlasting life. Wow! Now that's out of the book of John. Now the book of John is a book that's written with a very specific purpose, right? So if you read through that book, you will find a verse in there that says why the guy wrote the stuff he wrote. And it tells us in John 20, 30, 31, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. John says, I wrote the book so people would get saved. That's the reason why he wrote the book of John. And that's why there's so many great salvation verses in there. So, what if I told you that it was so easy to get to heaven, it's laughable. What if I told you there's a running joke in heaven? amongst the angels about how easy it is to get in. It's so simplistic, right? Now this is great news because the reason it's so easy is that you can't get in there of your own effort and work. Nothing you can do of your own merit will get you into heaven. The Bible is very clear on that. And now quite frequently, many of you, you look around and you look at other people and you think to yourselves, man, Colin, I've got, I've got issues, you know? That person walks better than me. That person talks better than me. That person thinks better than me. Colin, why did God make me this way? Because he loves you. Because he loves you. You say, Colin, that doesn't make any sense. Well, listen, the wisdom of the world is foolishness to God. We'll be coming back to that time. And again, the Bible says God chooses the poor, the despised, the weak to shame the wise. 
Listen, 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 30. For ye see your calling, brethren, how not many wise after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised, hath God chosen, and yea, and things which are not, to bring not things that are. Now why did he do that? The next verse tells us that no flesh should glory in his presence. No flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. He does it all. You don't do anything. Wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. It's not up to you at all. It is all on Christ. And that should be a great encouragement. That should be a huge encouragement. Because God does it all. He hates pride. Okay, God cannot stand pride at all. In fact, there's a verse in the Bible that says, Six things doth God hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto Him. Number one, a proud look. A proud look is hated by God above all else. There is nothing that God hates more than a proud look. Then pride. Now you say, God, this doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Well, listen, Galatians says... If any man thinketh he is something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. He deceives himself. Why? Because we are but dust. God is mindful that we are but dust. But we are not mindful that we are but dust. We always forget that every day. Now, God hates pride and that's great news. You say, Colin, why is that great news that God hates pride? For by grace are you saved through faith. And this not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Again, we come back to that boasting term, right? God doesn't owe anybody a debt. God's not going to listen to people boasting to him about their good works. Because what that shows is a dark heart. That shows somebody that doesn't understand their true state. Someone that thinks they are something when they're nothing. Someone who has deceived themselves. Now, you know something that breeds pride? and self-dejection comparison with others comparison with others will either breed pride or self-dejection because you will look at other people and you will say they are better than me or they are worse than me and because of that you will either exalt yourself or debase yourself right now many of you are here today because of bullying because somebody else who thought they were better than you, who had deceived themselves, looks at you, says bad things about you, but really the issue is them. And they try to exalt themselves above you. They're not mindful that they're but dust. God hates pride. Now, 2 Corinthians, it says this, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. When you compare yourself to other people, you are not wise. As Christians, I should not look at another Christian and say, wow, I'm better than that guy. Whew. Thank goodness. What did Paul say? To me, the very least of all saints, this grace is given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to make known the mystery which for ages past has been hidden in God who created all things so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with his eternal purposes in Christ Jesus. So when you compare yourselves, you are being unwise. Now, I see Tristan here. I'm so glad. Tristan, will you come up here real quick, please? Thank you so much. Just stand next to me. Now, who's taller? Me or Tristan? Me. me. Right, pretty clearly. I'm about a foot taller already. Now, if I were to say to you, who's closer to the moon? Me or Tristan? You would say, Colin, that's absurd. The moon's hundreds of thousands of miles away. The distance between you and the moon and Tristan and the moon is practically negligible. Why would you bring that up? Trent, I'm sorry. Why would you bring that up? Because Jesus Christ is the moon, right? That is who we compare ourselves to. I am never going to be the moon. And if I look at anybody else and say, I'm closer to the moon than you, you can see how foolish that is. Go ahead and sit down. Thank you. 
We do not need to compare ourselves to other Christians, to other people at all. We should only compare ourselves to Jesus. And if we do that, we will stay humble because we will find that we will continually fall short. And that's okay because Christianity is the one thing you cannot fail at. And we'll get into that in a minute. Now, I love kids so much because kids are humble and quite often without pride. Now, Jesus used children as an illustration in the Bible. So there was a time when the disciples were meeting in Matthew 18. And it says, at the same time came the disciples unto Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? They're comparing themselves among themselves. They're being unwise. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And what did Jesus say? He used a visualization. Jesus called a little child, not even a child, a little child. Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily, truthfully, I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Wow. So, are you telling me, Colin, that as a child I can be greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Because children are humble and without pride. Right? And the Bible says, those who exalt themselves will be debased, right? Those who humble themselves will be exalted. So, we talked about God hating pride, but we need to understand one of the reasons why God hates pride is because pride is what started it all, right? We oftentimes we think about original sin and we talk about Adam and Eve eating the fruit, but do you know what the real original sin of the universe was? It was pride. It was pride. Satan wanted to be like God. Man did not fall before Satan. Satan was the first being in the universe to sin, okay? And his sin was pride. Pride is the reason we're all here today. Pride is the reason we're not in paradise right now. Pride, pride, pride is why you have issues, mental, physical, why we get sick, have headaches, why there's lightning strikes, dog bites, all of it. You may say, Colin, this is bad, this is judgment, this is terrible, why does God do this? But really, it is mercy. It is creation itself calling out to us, fallen, fallen, fallen. You need a savior. It's a constant reminder of the issues that we're not supposed to be this way. Let me tell you a story. Mr. Collin used to see kids. Now I just go around to schools and manage the campuses and things like that. And I went to a school where one of my old clients was. And let's call her Moaney, right? And so I went up there, and she saw me, and she ran up to me. Mr. Collin, Mr. Collin, Mr. Collin. So excited, and I just lit up. And you know what she said to me? She said, Mr. Collin, you know how God made me with stomach acid that doesn't let me dissolve my food? I didn't know what to say. I said, yeah, I know. Well, that's a good thing, Mr. Collin. That's a good thing. It's good to have problems, Mr. Collin, because if we didn't have problems, Everyone would think everything is okay. Wow. From the mouth of babes, right? Listen to me. Problems keep us constantly reminded that it's not supposed to be this way. It's not supposed to be like this. You're not supposed to have these difficulties, these problems. We're not supposed to have issues with our thinking, with our behavior, with our ability to communicate. None of it. These problems remind us that it's not supposed to be this way. See, so often we think this is us. You think that's you. That's not you. That's a body. That's not Trenton. That's not Natasha. That's a body that contains Natasha's soul. This is not me. This is a body that contains my soul. One day, everybody in here is going to get very old and die. And this body will be corrupted but you know what we are promised we're gonna get a new body if we believe listen first Corinthians 15 42 44 so also is the resurrection of the dead it is sown in corruption it is raised in incorruption it is sown in dishonor it is raised in glory it is sown in weakness raised in power sown a natural body it is raised a spiritual body there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body doesn't get any clearer you can have a brand new body and you know what this life that seems so difficult that seems so tedious with so much suffering and pain look it's the blink of an eye man 
It's nothing. It's going to be over before you know it. It could end at any time. We are so fragile. And see, we like to think of time and distances. There are like 6 billion people on Earth now. There's probably been close to 25 billion people throughout history that have lived on the planet Earth at one time or another. I'm just one of them. You're just one of them. You don't matter. I don't matter. There's no purpose to us on this Earth without Christ. Right? We need to understand there's nothing in us inherently of value. God is no respecter of persons. And the reason why so many people with difficulties and poverty get saved, because they recognize they're nothing. While all the other people think they're something and have deceived themselves. You say, okay, Colin, I get it. I'm going to go to heaven one day. But what about here and now? You say, I can't succeed in this world, Colin. You say, i got to try ten times harder just to keep up with the guy next to me who's not even trying his best. Why shouldn't I just give up? Let me tell you a story. How many people here like Mario Kart? Mario Kart? Yeah, man, my people, Mario Kart. Anyone, man. Doesn't matter, as long as it's Mario Kart. Mr. Colin used to play Mario Kart when I was a kid for hundreds and hundreds of hours. We play it all the time. You know what I love about Mario Kart? You get in your car and you see somebody and you hit him with the turtle shell, right? What happens when you hit him with the turtle shell? They go spinning. Sometimes when you go spinning after you're hit with a turtle shell, you start going the wrong way. But you know what Mario Kart does? Flashes big words on the screen. Wrong way, wrong way, turn around, wrong way. So you're able to figure things out and get going the other way. But guess what? In the world, there's no flashing signs, right? So people, they get on the wrong track and there's nothing to tell them that. And they keep going and going and going down the wrong path. And so you say to me, why should you keep trying when other people are able to make more progress in terms of actual distance? Because they're not actually making progress. They're chasing all the wrong things of this world. First off, look at the culture. It's totally dark. It's totally wicked. Watch the commercials today. Watch TV today. Any of it. It's so dark. The celebrities, the musicians, the sports athletes. All they do is they chase money, they chase relationships, or they chase their own vain glory. That is what the world is after. The world doesn't understand that they're following the wrong trail. And you know where that trail leads? It doesn't lead to heaven. I'll tell you that. Now this would be discouraging if it weren't so easy to get saved. Couldn't be easier, couldn't be simpler. Have, now Easter is coming up, right? So I'll use a, a, an egg story. How many of y'all have been Easter egg hunting? Most people, okay. If you go to Easter eggs, Easter egg hunts with little kids, the eggs are just thrown out on the ground. They're not even hidden anywhere. They're just all over the ground. And I used to take my little girl and we'd go to these things and. How could you not get eggs? They're everywhere. There's no effort. It's like a scavenger hunt where you're guaranteed to win. Okay? Look, the Easter eggs of eternal life are scattered literally everywhere. They are all over at your feet and it could not be easier to pick an egg up with a free ticket to heaven. It's that simple. Now... What we have, though, despite the fact that God has absolutely littered the ground with Easter eggs full of eternal life, we have 90% of the world just like Mario Kart chasing the things that do not matter. You know what? People waste their lives on things that have no purpose, no point, and then they wake up at the end lost, confused, and in need of a Savior. Or worse yet, they never come out of their stupor at all. And they go happily straight to hell. That's the world we're living in. People are thinking they're doing things of their own effort and making progress, but really, they're either going the wrong way or spinning in circles. But you, God has chosen to put you in a school where you get to hear about Jesus Christ every day. Where you get to understand how easy it is to be saved. Where you can have your lives impacted by the God of the universe. There's a purpose for you, right? If you get a hold of this, if you strive, if you try, you can accomplish more than anything because God uses the weak to shame the mighty. The weak to shame the mighty. Now, you say, Colin, it's so easy to be saved. How come most people aren't going to heaven? 
Why aren't most people saved then, Colin? Well, there's many reasons, but we're going to discuss two. The first reason is that better people think they're more worthy. Better people think they're good enough, right? They will oftentimes try to do good deeds, be a good person, help people out, thinking in their own foolishness that judgment day is a scale where your good deeds and your bad deeds are weighed, and as long as your good deeds are more than your bad, you get in. I got news for you. You know what questions are asked on judgment day? There's no question about your good deeds. There's no question about your bad deeds. The only question that gets asked is what did you do with the gospel? Did you believe? It's not easy to get to heaven. Now, the other reason people don't believe is they might just be fools. And you say to me, Colin, you're preaching pretty hard. Look, again, this is why I love preaching, right? Because the Bible says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Right? You would look around, guys. Anybody think this building came here by accident? Better yet, anybody think this building came here from nothing? Of course not. It's absurd. So why on earth in our society and culture is this idea of the Big Bang Theory continually propagated? This idea that everything in the most ordered and perfect universe we've ever seen that works like a clock came about by accident, oh yeah, and came about from nothing. That's absurd. It's foolish. And if anybody believes such a thing, I have no problem telling them that they're a fool because that's what the Bible believes. I have more respect for the man or the woman who follows a different religion than the person who's an atheist because the person following a different religion is merely confused and wrong. They're not a fool. They just haven't been exposed to the light of the gospel. But when you talk about the atheist, the one that denies the existence of God altogether, there's no room left. They're clearly foolish. In fact, let's take a look at a man who's widely considered the apostle of atheism. Now, many of you will never heard of this guy. His name's Stephen Hawking, but he's considered the smartest man alive by many people. And I want to read you a quote because this is a guy that propagates the Big Bang, this idea that everything came from nothing. This is from Wikipedia. In the late 1970s, Hawking was elected Lucasian professor of mathematics at the University of Cambridge. At the same time, he was also making a transition in his approach to physics becoming more intuitive and speculative rather than relying on mathematical proofs. I would rather be right than rigorous, he told Kit Thorne. Why don't we ever hear this on the news? Why do they put these people up there and they act like these guys are geniuses and they've worked out these mathematical equations that prove God doesn't exist and they, they make quotes like, because laws such as gravity exist, the universe can and will create itself. It doesn't even make sense, right? Yet we exalt these men as if they're something. They're fools. And the idea that everything came from nothing is absurd. Now, because God's giving away free tickets to hell, there's not going to be any excuse on Judgment Day. There's nobody that is going to be able to mediate for you. If you don't pick up one of these Easter eggs that are all over the ground, when Judgment Day comes, your parents cannot fall down. Your teachers, Miss Natasha, cannot fall down and say, Lord, let them in. Let them in. My employees, the people that work for me, the people that read my scriptures every week, I have no doubt on Judgment Day some will not make it into heaven. No doubt about it in my mind. But you know what I'm not going to be able to do? Fall down on my knees and say, Lord, please, please, they didn't know. I love this person. Let them in with me. Not going to happen. You know why? It tells us in First Timothy 2 5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Right? Because he was a man. Yes, he was 100% God, but he was 100% man too. That should be a great encouragement to us. All right? He is the mediator. He's the only one that goes to the Father and says, Look, they believed in me, let them in. And the Father is happy to do so happy to do so. Now, you say, okay, Colin, I get it. I can get saved. It's real easy. It's not by works. I don't have to do anything. But I know once I become a Christian, I got to start living right, don't I? I got to start, you know, if not doing good deeds, I've got to stop doing bad ones, right, Mr. Colin? Now, let me prove to you that you do not have to change anything about your behavior, about your thoughts, about anything about you at all. All you have to do is believe. Now, don't get me wrong, the Bible is full of rules and regulations. 
However, those rules and regulations have zero to do with getting in the door of heaven. All of that comes into play with your rewards. Okay, now we don't have time to get into the subject of Christian rewards in heaven. But suffice to say, following good, good deeds or not doing bad ones has nothing to do with getting in the door. Now, now here we go. Titus 1-2, in hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. So if God said that for my grace are you saved through faith, and this not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Not of works, and then it takes works to get into heaven? He lied. And so we see multiple times in the Bible where it says God has limited himself. You see, God cannot do anything. God is omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, but he can't do anything because he is self-limiting. He has limited himself. He has given his word that he will never lie, that he will never change. So we can have great confidence that even though in theory, since God can do anything, he could theoretically lie, he's not going to because he said he's not. And he's always true to his word. Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Listen, God is going to do everything he says. So I want to hammer this, this idea home that all it takes is belief. Romans, or excuse me, Hebrews 4, 3. For we which have believed do enter rest. Now how many people here have had a full day of rest before? You just rested all day, yeah. Any way you would ever describe that as hard work? No, no. Nobody would ever say, oh man, I got a real hard day of rest today. I just got to, exactly, it's ridiculous. Salvation is called entering God's rest. Romans 4, 4 and 5. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth, to him, his faith is credited unto him as righteousness. It says right there, look, if you try to work your way to heaven, that is a certain way to make sure you won't get there. To him that worketh not. It doesn't say to him that worketh a little bit. To him that worketh not, but believeth, his faith is counted unto him as righteousness. Now you say to me, Colin, I can't believe it. All I ever hear is that... You know, I either have to do good deeds, and you're showing me that I don't do that, but then I hear all the time i got to stop doing bad deeds. So, that, I mean, surely I must change something, otherwise I can't get into heaven. Now, let's take a look even, even further at some folks that listed their good works to God, and he cast them out. So Matthew 7, it says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that practice iniquity. Now let me tell you something. If that was me, and it was judgment day, and God said, Psh, you're not in, I'd say, Lord, Lord, I believed in you. I put my faith in you. You said whosoever believeth will be saved. Why am I not getting in? I would never reference my works. I would never say, God, I was up there preaching to kids with autism. God, I was out there serving the homeless food and putting them in housing. God, I was doing this and that. Do you hear how stupid that is? That's absurd. Like God owes me a debt to get in heaven. We just read, now to him that worketh not is reward not working of grace, but of debt. God doesn't want people boasting. God doesn't want people telling him, you owe me, God. You owe me to let me in. Now, having cleared up that with the good works, I'm going to jump into for a second the idea of repenting of sins, not being required for salvation. So we talked about how we're going to be discerning spiritual to spiritual. Now, it says in Romans 7, the Apostle Paul, a man that many people say is the greatest Christian who ever lived outside of Jesus Christ himself. Paul says, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, these are the things that I do. He said that after he was saved, right? Because we have this body of death, this body of corruption, right? We cannot... We're always going to fall short of the glory of God, even after we're saved, no matter how hard we try. Because again, Jesus is the moon, right? I'm never going to reach that height. 
Never. I will always fall short of the moon, no matter how high I can jump. I could be the Incredible Hulk. I'm never getting close to the moon. You understand? All right. Now, let's look at stopping our bad deeds, right? Now, again, discerning spiritual is spiritual. The book of Jonah, the guy that gets eaten by the whale, okay? He gets spit out by the whale, and he goes to Nineveh to preach the sermon to everybody to get him to turn. And everybody in Nineveh turns from their sins. And you know what God says? And God saw their works, how they turned from their wicked ways. And God repented of the evil that he was going to do unto them. God saw their works, how they turned from their wicked ways. God defines turning from wickedness as a work. We have seen through verse and verse, works are not required to get into heaven. Ergo, stopping sinning has nothing to do with it because it's a work. Now, Galatians 2.21 says this, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. In other words, if God could give us this law and we could follow it, and that's how you could get to heaven, he didn't have to kill his own kid. He didn't have to crucify Christ if people could have gotten in by following the law. But you know what the Bible says? The law was our schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. Because the law shows us that we can't do it. Right? We can't follow the law. We can't, even after we're saved, it shows us even more our need for grace. Romans 10, 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Romans 11, 5 and 6, even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. That was a lot of words, but what Paul is saying, words matter. You can't say it's by grace, then tell people they have to do something. You can't say it's by works and then tell them that you made it in by grace. Words matter. And God's words are perfect and pure. Sweet as the honeycomb, the book of Psalms says. So we need to understand God's word is telling us it has nothing to do with your deeds or anything in you at all, but only your faith. Now, how do you get saved? I'm going to close with this. Romans 10, 9, it says, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Believe in thine heart God raised him from the dead. Romans 10, 11, 13, For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew, the Greek, the typically developing, those with special needs, the rich, the poor, the tall, the short, the sick, the healthy. There's no difference. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now let me tell you this story, and then this is it, we're done. In the book of Acts, Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas, now, Paul is one of the guys we consider one of the greatest Christians. Silas was his right hand. They went out doing mission work constantly, right? Now, they had an issue come up in Philippi where they got arrested and they got beat up real bad and they got thrown in jail, right? And they're in the Philippian jail. And by the way, this isn't an American jail. This is like a Mexican jail. This is like a Thailand jail. This is a jail of abject poverty, sickness, disgusting everywhere. They're in a cave in stocks, okay? And they're singing hymns to God. So next time you think your situation is bad, oh Lord, it's so difficult, I'm having to start singing hymns to God. The Lord inhabits the praises of his people. So they're singing hymns to God inside the cave. Suddenly, there's an earthquake. Everything breaks and they're set free. But you know what? They don't flee. They stay there. The Philippian jailer comes. He says, oh no, there's been an earthquake. Everybody's run away. He pulls out his sword to kill himself because you know that's what's going to happen to him when they find out he let the prisoners escape. Paul and Silas said, no, no, sir, no, we have not fled, we are here. Now the Philippian jailer, he has been so impressed by the power of God, and he's been hearing Paul and Silas talk about Jesus, because really that's all they ever do, is go around and talk about Jesus. So he has some understanding of doctrine, and he says, sirs, sirs, what must I do to be saved? 
And Paul turns to him and Paul says, just raise your hand at just the right time. I see that hand. God bless you. No. Paul says, look, just turn from all your sins and try really hard. No. Paul says, believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your whole household. There's no altar call. There's no hand raising. There's in your heart believing the truth. And at that exact moment, the atonement takes place. And everything bad you've ever done is placed on Jesus. And everything good Jesus has ever done is placed on you. And God looks at you as if you're Jesus. And He loves you unconditionally. That is what happens when you believe. Let me close this in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity for me to speak, Lord God. I thank you that uh, I didn't get too loud for the kiddies, Lord. And I just pray that you just help uh, the word that was sown today to uh, dwell reach, richly in their hearts, Lord. I pray that the children will think on this today and that our individuals will come to salvation. In Jesus' name, amen.
I'll do it. I'll do it. All right. So, uh, Mr. Tosh has asked me to say a little prayer for you guys. Basically, I'll lead y'all listen. You don't even have to say a prayer doesn't get you into heaven. Believing in your heart. But sometimes as humans, right, the act of praying or raising our hand or running up to an altar or any of these fleshly means, they make us feel better. They make us feel like our commitment is more certain, okay? But you don't have to do any of this to be saved. All you must do is believe. But I'm going to lead you guys in a prayer for salvation. If you want, you can repeat after me in your mind. You have to say anything with your mouth or anything because, again, this is about your heart and what you believe. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you, God. Uh, I am a sinner, and Lord, you have agreed to save us by placing our faith in the finished work of Christ. Lord, I just reaffirm that I am putting my faith in anybody else here today, Lord, that they are thinking in their hearts and their minds that they want to put their faith in you, Lord. I just pray you just give them that peace right now and touch their heart. We thank you that you've made it so simple. If it was any harder, we'd screw it up. In Jesus' name, amen.